Good evening. Welcome to WSBI, your resource for success podcast program, where you get to meet inspiring women-owned businesses from across the country. And now for your host, Kimberly McElmore. Good evening and welcome to WSBI, your resource for success podcast program, where you get to meet inspiring entrepreneurs and women owned businesses from across the country. I am your host, Kimberly McLemore, president and CEO of the Women's Small Business Initiative, LLC, and award winning author. And welcome to another night of sharing with us. We have Lizzie Horvitz. Vinch aims to decode sustainability and empower consumers to make better purchasing decisions. Lizzie started Finch in March of 2020 to educate people on the ins and outs of sustainability by turning complex scientific facts into simple, actionable insights. Launched as a browser extension in May, Finch fuses expert scores on products, environmental impacts with functional reviews from real people. Lizzie has been passionate about sustainability since the age of 16, when she lived off the grid. It was there that, depending only on wind, energy, and rainwater, she saw the solution of climate change before fully understanding the problem. Before Finch, Lizzie worked in supply chain and sustainability at Unilever and then became Chief Operating Officer at Muse, a startup that aims to mitigate single-use plastics in the to-go industry. She has a BA from Middlebury College and an MBA and Master of Environmental Management from Yale University. So without further ado, please help me welcome to my platform, Ms. Lizzie Horvitz. Hello, Lizzie. How are you? Hi, Kimberly. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Well, I'm excited to have you. You have a very, very interesting background, so it's going to be a great conversation to hear all about your understanding of, you know, what, you know, when it comes down to understanding, um, depending on the wind, energy and rain and understanding the change, the climate change, because, it's a, it's one of those factors that people don't like to talk about. And then when they do talk about it, they don't believe that it exists. So I'm really, really excited about being able to communicate with you about this tonight. But before we get started, Lizzie, could you just tell the listeners a little bit more about who Lizzie Horvitz really is? Absolutely. So I, as you mentioned, have been passionate about sustainability since I was 16. So at this point, it's been a little over half my life. And I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I now live in Denver, Colorado. I love the outdoors. I love to ski. Um, and I'm a big singer and, um, have been really focused on Finch for the past two years. I've loved building a company. I never thought about being an entrepreneur before two years ago. And, um, it's been a great decision. Wow. Very, very interesting. So let's kind of backtrack and go back way back. <laughs> so because you obviously, you know, Let's your business is pretty, pretty, fairly new to us. So I really kind of want to know about, you know, how you really got started in this. What made you truly interested in just having any idea of, of this type of a business? Because, um, you know, like say so you started out in a simple, simpler uh, process in turn when it came to infusing, doing Finch Fuses expert scores and all that type of stuff. So you use it as a browser. You la- launched off, launched out as a browser extension. But talk about all the things that came prior to that, you know, what was, um, you know, what did you do in college and and how did you end up getting to this point? Absolutely. So after this experience, when I was 16, I focused on environmental history in college, which the college that I went to is very strong in environmental studies. And so you have to have some sort of focus with it. And I chose history, which I think it's been really helpful because it gave me the opportunity to go through different decades and understand sort of where we were as a country and as a planet fighting climate change, right? So you go through the governmental um, regulations in the 70s and then, you know, um, company innovations in the 80s, et cetera, et cetera. And I think in order to move forward in a sustainable way, we need to understand where we came from. And so... After college, I I wasn't really sure how I wanted to fight for the environment, but I knew I wanted to be involved somehow. So I went to go work for the Natural Resources Defense Council, which was, I always say, like the most spoiled place to start a job because, or to start your career, because I just worked with the most fantastic, smartest group of people um, and really loved, loved that work. But 
realized pretty early on that they were fighting these problems that they've been fighting for the past 30 years and they were suing companies and governments that um, had already made these mistakes. And I mm-hmm. thought to myself, I'd rather be inside of that company making decisions from the beginning versus, um, you know, being on the, on the reactive side. Mm-hmm. So I, I went to go get my MBA and my master's in environmental management where I really focused on what large companies can do to reduce their carbon footprint and really just minimize their impact. So that, um, that grad school experience took me to Unilever, where I worked on their supply chain team and then on their sustainability team. And while I was there, something really interesting started happening in my personal life, where because I'm one of the only people in my larger community who has a formal background in this space, I began to get a ton of questions around, you know, is this ingredient safe for my baby or what mm-hmm. type of sunscreen is the best to buy, et cetera. And I didn't know where to point them towards and I didn't have all the answers. I found that online, you know, I'd love, Kimberly, if you have ideas, if you have thoughts on this, but when you research anything like this, you know, you'll get a whole bunch of different things that show up on Google, and you don't know which one to listen to, right? There's, like, a lot of academic papers that are tough to get through. And then on the other side, you have this rise of bloggers who are saying things like eco-friendly and all-natural, and that's not based on any type of data. And so I started a newsletter just aiming to distill this type of information, and um, meanwhile, I decided to leave Unilever and to try something new. So I joined a very early stage startup and it was there that I really just fell in love completely with entrepreneurship, changing company from inception to scale. Um, I found that my skill set was really well suited for a company at that stage. And so right at the beginning of COVID, it's funny, it's exactly really two years ago, I mm-hmm. decided to, um, to, move forward and and do this newsletter full time. And that's really how Finch came to be. Wow. Wow. That's pretty interesting. So I guess, you know, with Finch, talk a little bit about really what Finch does. I mean, obviously I read some of it, but just give us the listeners a little bit better understanding because environmental management and understanding about the environment period is very, like you said, can be confusing. We can all get online and look up things, but what are we really looking for and what are we trying to understand? Absolutely. It's a really important question because I think to everybody, sustainability and to your point, environmental management means a whole bunch of different things. So for us, we look at an all encompassing definition of sustainability, which is really how is this affecting human lives? How is this affecting wildlife, the world around us? And we, you know, we use the definition of sustainability as living in a way that doesn't compromise future generations, but that meets the needs of our own. Mm -hmm. And so Finch basically takes all these different attributes, everything ranging from, you know, what's the level of carcinogen ingredients um, potential in this, in this uh, product all the way to will the shed microplastics. And then of course, you know, what's the carbon footprint, how heavy was this to ship, et cetera. We put that through a machine learning algorithm and then we spit out scores um, on products that are sold on Amazon. And so basically when you're shopping, mm-hmm. you type in, um, you know, Dove Body Wash. And we'll show you, okay, this gets a 6 out of 10. You can Here's what we like about it. Here's what could be better. And if, in case you want to make a better decision and, and get a product that rates, you know, a higher than a 9 out of 10, here are some alternatives that you can purchase. And so we try to equip the consumer with as much information as they want Mm -hmm. without overwhelming them Mm -hmm. while also making it really easy for them to make better decisions um, as long as it doesn't, you know, take over their lives in terms of research. Right, right, right. (laughs) Because you're right. I mean, when we do research, you know, and then not knowing this existed, you know, most people would just, we just keep going. We just keep going. We keep looking, keep looking, but then it's, you know, overload of information. And then, like I said, trying to pick and choose what is best for us to purchase or just learn information period. And even though, you know, you utilize or help a lot with the um, Amazon, even on Amazon, it can be a little somewhat confusing because we all have preferences, right? So with those preferences, it's like, how do you get people to really engage inside to decide, you know, this is truly my preference, but it says A, B, C, and D. And should I move over here to, (laughs) to this other product because it's supposed to be better, you know? So it's, it's like, 
try how do you really truly get people to get engaged in that and how do you work with these companies in order to involve them with this um, new product or process that you have well the preferences is such an such an important aspect of what we do and honestly we haven't cracked it yet and that's Mm -hmm. actually why we started with the with the product set that we did we started with products that you buy often and that are relatively less expensive there are a couple of outliers like we have rated mattresses which obviously you hopefully only buy every you know Mm -hmm. decade or something Mm -hmm. um but we chose these products because we found that people don't have as much loyalty to say the toilet paper brand that they use or the paper towels they're willing to try another brand Mm -hmm. and worst case is they it it doesn't work out for them and and they get to buy a new brand you know in another month or so um i think As our machine learning model gets stronger, what we're excited to do is say, um, okay, if you don't like any scented products or you don't like lavender, we can, um, we can sort of filter out for those types of preferences. Mm -hmm. Um, but we always give an option and that's also how we do the rating. It's not, it's not good or bad. It's on a scale. So if you see a score that's a three, we would highly recommend that you try to find another product but if you see a seven yes could you get an eight a nine or ten sure but if you love that brand and and it's worked for you in the past go ahead and get the seven we're all about um i think a a differentiator for finch is we're all about progress not perfection we all even the employees in finch have things that we're not really willing to compromise on right Mm -hmm. and so um and that's okay we're not expecting everybody to become you know a zero waste fanatic (laughs) <laughs> but the point is there are things that everybody can do to sort of improve. And so we mm-hmm. just want to be there as a resource when people are, are more open to change. Right, right. Well, I do kind of like the, the, the toilet tissue, you know, comparison, because I think a lot of times too, when people start to look at certain products and of course, you know, we, today things are so inflated. So I, you know, it's not that I don't, I think my thought process is that it's not always that people really want to change, but you know, they're willing to make a change maybe because the inflation is, you know, is this product that I normally use is much higher than what I can afford this time. So I'm going to try this product because it has good ratings, you know? So there's, I think there's a lot of thought process behind that when people are looking at their products um, that, you know, that they really think are, are more beneficial, but there's all these other elements outside of their thought process that are helping them make the decisions that they make. Do you think there is a part of some of the flexibility that you're seeing when you guys are looking at these type of scores? Yes, absolutely. I mean, part of what we do in our scores is we include function and quality into these products because the least sustainable thing you can possibly do is buy a product and then not use all of it, right? Mm -hmm. We should be utilizing every last drop of whatever we're buying. So if you buy a new cleanser that we've recommended and you don't like it, that's that's the worst experience overall for, for us and for the consumer, obviously, because they've just spent money on this. And so we like to incorporate, you know, um, what are, what's the ratings on Amazon? And eventually we hope to have our own internal rating system where we say, not only do we know the sustainability of this, but we also know the function and quality and how people will like it. Obviously mm-hmm. that gets more difficult when you're talking about personal preferences like jewelry, apparel, you know, things that are design focused. But Mm -hmm. for now, um, we, we found through our user base that um, our recommendations have, have landed pretty well so far. Wow. Wow. It's very interesting because, well, first of all, I can say I've never heard of Finch. And so I'm really glad that we have the opportunity to, to have this conversation so that people can, you know, look you up, figure out, hey, what is this really going on here so that we can understand I can look for better products and get a better scoring or at least put my two cents in of what it is on those products that I'm actually using. Because obviously we've, you know, hear about the kind of scoring system of, you know, whether you like something or don't like it. And, you know, a lot of times I'm the type of person, if I see something, I'm like, okay, well, we have a lot of fives up here, but let me read what's going on in the one and twos. (laughs) Okay. So it's sometimes, you know, (laughs) where I really will focus on and make my decision. I'm like, "Mm, you know, okay. That, you know, it may not seem like that, those five or six people that, you know, 10% or 20% of the people may not seem like it's a lot, but in my thought process, I'm like, well, there's a reason why, you know, these people thought that this was a terrible product or there's something going wrong with this. And then, and of course, you know, when you go through and obviously review some of it, it's normally just a 
more, mostly a personal preference. And then some of it is very accurate where, you know, the item is falling to pieces. I think I was looking up something the other day and it was like, oh, you know, I, I want to get something to wrap my knees because I have bad knees, but I like to work out. Right. So I'm going through and I'm reading all these, this information. I'm like, mm-hmm. there's nothing good about any of these products, even though there's people that highly rated <laughs> at five. But then when you get down to the to actually three, two, and one, it all pretty much had the same information. Well, it's okay. You can wrap this around your knees, but you know, you may not be able to move it. It instantly comes apart, you know, so the product is no good. So I was like, wow. Right. Okay, it so- doesn't work. <laughs> Go ahead. You're going to say something. No, I was, just, I was agreeing. Like once you get down to that one and two, it, it you find out that it doesn't work in the way that you want it to. And it's so mm-hmm. frustrating. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So it's interesting, like I said, that you, you're doing something like this. So, you know, what you're doing, Lizzie, is very scientific, but also, like I said, it has a different aspect of environmental. So how, you know, I'm going to say with, with young women, you know, we always find that, you know, they're trying to continually find more women who want to be in, you know, or want to be a part of and learn more of science. What would you give advice and how would you help them gravitate or learn and realize that science is so much funner than most people really even understand? I think you're so right. I, it's funny. I never actually thought of myself as a real scientist until recently. I did not particularly excel in my (laughs) biology classes or chemistry (laughs) classes in high school and Mm -hmm. tried to stay away from them a little bit in college. Um, But I think What's really cool is when you're learning about biology and chemistry and all those things in in grade school and even in college, you're learning about such abstract or or theoretical ways to implement this. And what I wish, particularly young girls, but also, you know, women coming out of the coming into the workforce could recognize is that you can take those ideas and put them towards something that's really fun and interesting. Right. So Mm -hmm. learning about certain protons or atoms or things like that, that doesn't get me excited, but figuring out um, what ingredient might have an adverse effect on your skin, um, that that's really exciting, seeing how this can be implemented. And so I was just talking to a friend about this the other day. Mm-hmm. Um, it would be great if we could figure out in the education system to get young kids more exposure to those types of implementations. And we're finding this with environmental, with, with sustainability specifically, I'm finding this across the board, not just in science, but, you know, there are people that excelled in chemistry and all of a sudden can figure out that they can put their work towards um, a company like Finch or, you know, that goes beyond into marketing or mm-hmm. product development or any of this, these different areas. We're, we're seeing a really exciting trend because environmentalism is becoming more and more popular. Mm-hmm. We need all the help we can get. And so there's people that dedicated their education and even, you know, the first parts of their careers to something else can now take those skills and put them into sustainability because it's so interdisciplinary. Right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and you're right. And a lot of us, you know, we kind of don't don't like to gravitate to, oh, you know, what we did in biology, you know, class or science, because it wasn't, you know, it's it was fun, but it wasn't fun, you know, because at the end of the day, you're being tested out. But it's like, what are you really learning? And how can you take what you're learning and utilize it in a different aspect? And that's exactly what you've done. Um, and so to get more younger people interested in that. And and I always like to kind of stay with the fact that women need to be more interested in science. And I know that there are more people who are trying to do that, but they're all, there's so much, so much science out here that it's so many different levels and different avenues that this is just one of them that, you know, I think is important that we continue to have these type of conversations so that more young people will really look into this is that, you know what, this isn't just about the science. It's also about the environment. So talk a little bit about climate change and why, it's so important to you and what conversations would you be sharing with those people who don't understand, really truly don't understand climate change? Well, I think what's been so interesting is it's evolving so quickly. And even in my short, relatively speaking experience with this, you know, I've been in this space for 18 years. Mm -hmm. I remember, you know, in my late teens, early twenties, talking to people who were, who would say, you know, uh, I'm not even sure this is happening, right? And it would right. be, you know, oh, it's definitely, it's definitely going to happen, so we should get ahead of it. That was my rhetoric. Um, and then it was, you know, well, it's it's happening, but I don't know if humans are a part of it or if um, 
if we can do anything about it. Mm -hmm. And now the, the sad thing is, but it's also helpful, is that we're actually seeing these effects in real time, right? We're seeing so many more, you know, extreme weather events than we ever have before. And mm -hmm. we're seeing for the first time climate refugees who are not a part of the problem because they are emitting very, very small amounts of carbon, but they're forced to leave homes that they've been in for generations because their island is sinking, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that is, on the one hand, obviously a terrible thing that I wish we could have avoided, but on the other, it's been helpful to communicate this to people because it's a way to be like, okay, look at this part of the world today and mm -hmm. see see what's happening. So that's been an easy part of communicating it. I think for me, it's evolved too. I think in the very beginning, I am a real like animal lover. I come from a family. My mom is a, I think she likes animals more than humans most of the time. <laughs> and um, so I remember getting into this feeling like we have to save this biodiversity and this wildlife that's on, that's in our world. Mm -hmm. um, I became a vegetarian because of that. And I think it's evolved so much where of course I still, um, I still do things I think for the wildlife and for those who, you know, can't speak for themselves, but mm -hmm. it's much more a people problem now, right? When I think right. of environmental justice and how some people are forced to have, you know, coal plants in their backyards and other mm -hmm. people um are are protected from that what what happened in flint michigan you know all yes. these yeah. horrible atrocities that are happening because of our mismanagement of natural resources mm -hmm. is um something that's really really important to me so it's both sort of what do we do right now to get people better protected but also how do we stay on that long-term goal of making sure our grandchildren are able to still you know beautiful wild places mm -hmm. yeah exactly and you know when you talk about you know the climate change I mean, we can see every day it's you know one minute it's warm outside the next minute it's cold outside and then it's you know everything is to the extreme there is nothing that is yeah you know, relaxing where I can remember growing up as a kid. I mean, you knew when it was winter, it was winter. You had, you know, I'm from originally from Iowa. So we normally have long, very long winters starting normally towards the end of October, all the way through up to March. And, you know, you knew it was winter. Well, now you just don't know whether you're going to get winter one day or whether you're going to get summer one day, spring, or maybe everything all in the same time, you know, and it's all over the place. So, you know, when you think about that, I, I just try to, can't fathom that people don't understand that something is not right we're having to everything is too much you're of exactly right yeah you know things are just so tragic too there's not there's nothing that's you know small or sudden it's literally tragic every time something happens whether it's a tornado or whether it's a winter storm or you know uh, whether it's fires everything is at a very, at a very high level of trauma so exactly it, and just um yeah, it's funny to, to hear your experience in Iowa because my parents had the same exact experience in Cleveland growing up, as did I, honestly. But my, my mom talks about how, you know, every December through February, was there was snow on the ground. Every mm -hmm. single Christmas it was snowing, right? That was just what you expected. Yep. You had the same weather. Um, and now it's – I was just talking to someone in New York who had a snowstorm last Saturday, and mm -hmm. now it's complete springtime. And um, – it's it's wreaking havoc, and I think um, you know I, I like to be cautiously optimistic that we are enough people are now on this fight that that will turn things around. But I just wish people could have forced more people could have foreseen this um, a couple of decades ago. Right. Right. Well, and and my thought process always, you know. I don't understand how people didn't see this coming or they knew and didn't want to say anything or, you know, it's just, you know, with all the knowledge that we have in our world and our country and all the expertise, I just, you know, in my thought process, can't believe that certain things just aren't being taken care of. And, and the thought is why, why would you wait until you have no choice, you know, to, to in order to step up to the plate and say, look, we've got to do these things. Cause if we don't, we know we're not going to have earth. <laughs> you know I mean, it's like, you can see it every yep. day. And, you know, you go, you, when you, you're supposed to be in the coldest areas of the world and literally there, there's no more icebergs, you know, our polar bears are no longer, the, the, it's getting cool in there. It's getting warmer versus staying cool. So, I mean, it's all these little things that, you have to hear and, you know, you're not paying attention, you should, because it's really weird to think that it may come to a point where 
our Florida's will be in the area where they'll be the coldest, where our places like the Midwest will be the warmest. I may not live long enough to see that happen, <laughs> but that's it's almost like the direction that, you know, it's we may, that we're going to. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's, it's very scary. It's very scary, but you know, it's great that we have people like you who still, you know, are out there fighting the good fight for us and the rest of us just need to get on board and do our part. And that's really what it boils down to. Thank you so much. Yeah. And that's the goal too, is that we, you know, we're realistic at Finch and we don't expect everybody to be spending hours and hours to figure out what part they can play. Um, that's why we just want to make it as easy as possible so that people don't have the excuse of, you know, I feel helpless. I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. This is an optimistic, bright brand and company where mm-hmm. we're trying to instill some hope in everybody. All right. Well, I tell you, this has been a very intriguing and interesting conversation this evening because I don't always get a lot of people who want to talk about science and environmental management and all this. So this has been great. And I'm hoping that for those who are listening are truly opening their ears and understanding that, first of all, it's in a unique, very unique business within itself. But at the same time, it's been very educational. So, you know, for anyone who is truly interested in learning more about what Lizzie does in her company, Finch. You know, Lizzie, why don't you tell everybody how they can get a hold of you? And if they have anything else you would like to share with us, please do so. Thank you so much. So I think the first thing is to go on our website, choosefinch.com, and download our extension. And the other thing that I would ask is, we, you know, we're still small enough that we get requests from, from everyday people like your listeners who just want to know about a specific topic or have feedback for us. And I welcome all of those. I, I read those personally. And so if anybody wants to reach out to us at hey at choosefinch.com, please do so. And then we're also on Instagram and Twitter at choosefinch. All right. Well, wow. again, I thank you. Do you have any last words? No, thank you so much for having me, Kimberly. This is great. No, it's been my pleasure. And again, I appreciate you spending a little bit of time with me, Lizzie. It has been absolutely wonderful to get educated this evening. And I hope that everybody else has enjoyed this conversation that we're having. And then also the fact that, you know, hey, your purchasing decisions are important. You know, your uh, thought process and why you're purchasing that, you know, tell us. Give her the scores, get on there and re- look at the products and understand why you're, you're, you're buying them and, you know, give a review because that's really the most important thing. And that's how we all learn what is what and how, you know, how it affects us personally, what, how it affects our communities, how it affects our environment, all of that. So, you know, if, if you do have more questions or if you want to have an, uh, another conversation, you know, you're more than welcome to reach out to me at Kimberly at WSBILC at gmail.com. And I can definitely get you in contact with Lizzie if you need so, or you will go to the actual information that she provided. And we will also provide this information, her, the contact information um, in the DM, of course, so that you can check out all this on your own. But again, you know, it's making those better decisions is what's most important. And that's what she's trying to teach us to do. And of course, like my also thing is that if you have any steps you want to take and just learn about business as a whole, please, you know, again, you can reach out to me. Let's get you taking those dreams and turning them into goals. And of course, if you want more of your resource for success, we do now accept monetary donations to support the podcast. And we uh, take those through Cash App, PayPal, uh, Good Pods, Tip Jar, or you can go directly to the website at www.wsbilc.com. Again, we would like to thank you all for listening to us tonight. We'll be back next week with more amazing guests, but be sure to follow us right here on iHeartRadio or wherever you listen to your podcasts. But until then, enjoy the rest of the evening and good night. Good night, everyone. We will be back next Thursday evening at 7 p.m. Follow us on Spreaker, www.spreaker.com slash user slash WSBI. View our new WSBI website anytime at www.wsbillc.com. And on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Instagram 